Welcome to this super short introduction to psychophysics. I'm just aiming to scratch the surface of the what, why and how of the subject. So beginning with what is psychophysics, it's a term that was introduced by Gustav Fechner back in 1860, and he defined it as an exact science of the functional or dependence relationships between bodies and souls. Less ambitiously nowadays, we might define it as in this recent textbook, it's the analysis of perception by studying the effect on experience of systematically varying the properties of a stimulus. Or still more succinctly, psychophysics is a study of the relationship between stimulus and sensation. I think psychophysics is really important in its own right. There are lots of reasons why one might want to measure very precisely uh, what humans can perceive. Uh, for example, in visual displays, um, if you're designing a visual display, you need to know exactly what level of detail, for example, and what colours a human being can perceive. So in terms of level of detail, that's typically quantified with the contrast sensitivity function. Um, you may have seen diagrams like this where you ask yourself, how far up do the stripes go? For me, the answer would be something like that. And that's a way of kind of eyeballing your own contrast sensitivity function. Because in reality, the uh, light and dark uh, grey across each row of this image uh, are exactly the same. It's only the frequency that's varying. And so my impression that the stripes are clearer in the middle than at the edges says something about my own visual system rather than the image itself. And so measuring contrast sensitivity, for example, can help me decide whether it's worth splashing out on a new 8K television. It's going to have more pixels. It's going to be able to display more detail. But given my own contrast sensitivity and details such as how far from the television I expect to be sitting, I can ask myself, will I be able to perceive the improvement that I would get um, physically with an 8K television? Or will it in fact be imperceptible to me given my visual system? Another example is trichromacy. So the idea that there are just three primary colours from which essentially all other perceptible colours can be synthesised. That was established by psychophysics back in the 19th century and is really important for technology. We see this example of three colour printing, a um, really early example from 1893. And the same idea is used on all our modern screens, that they have three types of pixels, red, green and blue, to synthesise all the colours that they present us with. And that brings me on to another really important thing about psychophysics. The precise measurement of perception is what enables you to form theories about the underlying neural representation, which you can then test with other neuroscientific approaches such as you know, physiological recordings. So I'm sure you're all well familiar with the idea that trichromacy, the neural substrate of trichromacy, are the three cone types, the photoreceptor classes that we have in our retina, um, and their absorbance spectra are shown here in the paper from 1980. But by purely psychophysical means, Hermann von Helmholtz was able to deduce really fairly accurate approximations to the sensitivity of the underlying human mechanisms for colour perception back in the 19th century, when they hadn't yet discovered that they were, were in fact different cone types within the retina. So I think this is a really nice example of how psychophysics was able to make powerful predictions that were subsequently borne out by physiology. Another great example, I think, is the Weber-Fechner law. So in order to explain this, I need the idea of just noticeable difference. So suppose, for example, you're holding a weight and then I add a small increment to it. The just noticeable difference is the smallest weight that I can add that you would just notice an increase in heaviness. Now, Weber found that in all sorts of domains, whether it was vision or sound or weight perception, the just noticeable difference was a constant fraction of the baseline. So, for example, the JND for weight isn't a fixed number of grams. It's, let's say, 5%. So, suppose you can just about notice a 1 gram increment from 20 to 21 grams. You will not notice a 1 gram increment from 100 to 101 grams. And if you start off holding a kilogram, you might need 50 grams before that's noticeable. So if we plot the JND as a function of the baseline stimulus intensity, we get a straight line. It's proportional one to the other. And that observation immediately suggested the idea of a logarithmic encoding of stimulus intensity. So the idea here is that you've got some physical properties such as, you know, 
weight or mass, the number of atoms, or luminance, number of photons. And that's causing some internal signal which is responsible for our perception. That internal signal is monotonically related to the underlying stimulus intensity, but not linearly. It might have this, say, logarithmic sublinear relationship. And so if you ask yourself, you know, what's the JND? Well, suppose the internal signal has to increase by this much, shown by this little triangle here for me to detect the difference, that's going to imply that the physical weight has to improve, has to increase this much, so that's going to be my measured J and D. But if I start from a larger baseline, then the exact same change in the internal signal is going to require a much larger change in the physical weight. And you can go through the maths, and you can work out that if the percept is a log function of the stimulus intensity, then uh, the change in stimulus intensity required to bring about a given change in percept is in fact proportional to the stimulus intensity itself, exactly as Bober's law describes. So turning now to how to do psychophysics, let's start off with possibly the simplest task of all, um, how much light do we need to see? So here's the title of a classic paper that concluded actually we need rather little light to see, that um, even if only a single photon of light is absorbed by as few as five rods, then we can, under some circumstances, perceive that. OK, so if you're designing an experiment like this, you might think of a design as follows, that on each trial you would flash up a certain amount of light, sometimes a bright flash, sometimes a dim flash, and after each flash of light you would ask the subject, did they see the light or not? So that would be a yes-no design. And then you could construct a so-called psychometric function in which you plot the probability of reporting yes as a function of the amount of light. And you might expect that for very little amounts of light, they wouldn't ever report seeing the light, whereas with very bright flashes, they would always report seeing the light. So the probability would end up being one. And you might further imagine that you could deduce something about how sensitive um, an observer is to light from the position of this psychometric function. So the observer whose curve is shown in green here, you might think, is more sensitive to light because they're reporting seeing light at lower light levels, whereas this purple subject here seems to be less sensitive because they're reporting, um, they're requiring more light before they say that they saw light. But this conclusion is in fact wrong, hence the warning sign. And let's see why that is. So let's go back to the underlying internal signal. So like we had when we were considering the Weber-Fechner law. I'm going to assume that this is a noisy signal. So for example, when there's no light, the average value of this signal is zero, but there's some noise. So if I plot its probability density function, let's say that's Gaussian, it's got a finite SD. And as I increase the amount of light, then the mean value of the distribution increases. So now let's think what is happening inside the subject on each trial of this yes-no task. On each trial, they're effectively only getting one value, one pick from this distribution. Uh, for example, the value shown by this brown arrow. And they have to decide, did I see a light or not? And really, to answer that, you have to set some kind of internal decision criterion. So shown here with the dashed line, you might decide, for example, if my noisy internal signal is lower than this value, then I will report, no, I didn't see a light. And if it's greater, then I'll say, yes, I saw a light. But the problem is that the decision criterion actually shifts the observed psychometric function. So suppose the observer sets their decision criterion at zero, then even when there's no light, they're going to report, yes, I saw a light, half the time. OK, so they'll be at 50% here. And then clearly when there's more light, they'll be more likely to report seeing one. If you have a more conservative subject who requires you know, quite a considerable signal before they report seeing a light, that will shift the psychometric function to the right. Or you might have a very gung-ho person whose decision criterion is actually negative. And so they're saying, yes, I saw a light almost all the time, um, even when no light was actually present. So in other words, you're confounding their sensitivity and their decision criterion um, in that the 
So in other words, the decision criterion is shifting the psychometric function left and right. And that means that its value at any single given point doesn't tell us anything about the underlying sensitivity. And so if you want to know how sensitive somebody is to light, a better way to do this experiment is with a two interval force choice detection task. So on every trial, you have two intervals and you can signal these with some audio cue, like beep, beep. On one of them, the screen is blank and in the other, there's a flash of light. And of course, you randomise which interval actually contains the light and you ask the subject, which interval do you think had the light? Now, there isn't any need for a decision criterion because the subject has got access to two internal signals, one from the first interval, one from the second, and we can assume that a rational strategy is to report whichever interval produced the larger value of the noisy signal, to say that was the one in which there was light. Now, the great advantage here is that the performance is always at 50% for zero signal. It has to be. If it isn't, then that means you didn't do your randomization correctly and it approaches one as you increase the, the stimulus intensity, so here the amount of light. And so now you can quantify performance by a single value, which we call the threshold. So you can define some percent correct in between chance at 50% and perfect at 100%, and that'll be your threshold. And now people with a low threshold genuinely are more sensitive to light, and people with a high threshold less sensitive. Now one thing to watch out for is that of course the threshold that you measure depends on what you define as being threshold performance. So you might think a logical choice is 75% uh, for this two interval a task, so that's halfway between chance and perfect. That's perfectly fine. Another common one is 84%, the rationale being that if this curve is a cumulative Gaussian, 84% represents a step of one standard deviation. It doesn't matter, both are perfectly valid choices, but you can see that depending on which you choose, you're going to get a different measured threshold. And that's something to bear in mind when you want to compare results from different studies. OK, so how can you measure this threshold once you've chosen how to define it? Well, one classic approach is the method of constant stimuli. So the idea here is that you choose a set of fixed values, a set of stimulus intensities, and you do many repetitions with each of those. And the dots here represent the proportion of reporting the correct interval um, as a function of the stimulus intensity. And then you fit a nice smooth curve, like a cumulative Gaussian, uh, through these points. And from that fitted curve, you can deduce the threshold. Now, this is a kind of gold standard method. I think it's really hard for it to go wrong, um, but it is very time consuming because you're collecting a lot of data with a lot of trials at each of these points. And you can see it's pretty inefficient because points where the subject is close to chance or where they're perfect are pretty uninformative when you're trying to work out where their threshold is. It would clearly be better and, and more efficient to try and uh, collect data at stimulus intensities that are close to the threshold. And that's what so-called staircase techniques try to achieve. So to talk you through a staircase, I'm actually first going to show you an alternative way of representing the method of constant stimuli. So now I've got stimulus intensity up the y-axis and along the x-axis I've got trial number. So these uh, yellow dashed lines mark the, the values I've chosen, the constant stimuli. And on trial one, I happen to choose a uh, low intensity, on trial two, a medium one, on trial three, a high intensity. But these are just random, right? On every trial, I'm choosing a different, uh, randomly picking a different one of these uh, constant stimuli. And I'm representing trials on which the subject got the answer correct with green squares and trials where they got the answer wrong with these red disks. And you can see when the stimulus intensity is low, the subject's close to chance, and so there are approximately equal numbers of wrong and right answers. Whereas when the stimulus intensity is high, they're getting it correct almost all the time. And then you can work out where the threshold value is by doing that fit, as we saw in the previous figure. And you can see this involves a large number of trials, which is why it's inefficient. Now, in contrast, a staircase procedure will typically start off with a high stimulus intensity to make the task very easy, so we expect the subject to get the answer right. 
And so then on the next trial, we make the stimulus intensity lower, so the trial's harder. And we carry on reducing the stimulus intensity until they make a mistake. So this red point here. And then we make it easier again. And then we start making it harder until they make another mistake. And then we reverse again. And you can see that the steps, the changes, are reducing with time. So the idea is that we're gradually homing in on this threshold, going up and down, like walking up and down a staircase around the threshold value. So the staircase method, as you can see, is much faster than the method of constant stimuli. I would say in my experience, you can get a reasonably accurate threshold in, say, 30 trials with the staircase, whereas you might need 300 with method of constant stimuli. The con in my experience is that a few early errors, say button press errors or whatever from the subject, can really throw a staircase off and it can struggle to recover from that. So if you want an accurate answer, I would suggest averaging several different staircase measurements. As you can imagine, it's more complex to code a staircase procedure, but fortunately several libraries exist to help you with that, such as Psych Toolbox or PsychoPy. Now, the detection threshold is really just a special case of a JND. It's the just noticeable difference from zero. But we can also do a discrimination task in which we're comparing two different stimuli. We could ask, for example, which weight is heavier, which light is brighter, which dots are moving faster, which line is longer, and so on. And when you're doing that, it makes sense to ask for the point of subjective equivalence as well as the just noticeable difference. For example, you might be interested in perceptual biases. So I'm sure you've seen optical illusions like this lots of times before. Um, if I ask you which is brighter, you're probably going to say that the disc on the left appears brighter to you. And I've here tried to adjust the brightness or the luminance of the discs until they appear equally bright to me on this particular display. And I would say it's something like that. But, as I'm sure you've guessed, um, in fact, the discs in this image are of the same physical luminance, and this point of subjective equivalence has the disc on the left being actually somewhat dimmer. And, again, we can draw inferences about the underlying neural representation. It suggests that the internal signal on which my perception is based isn't so much luminance of this little disc, but rather something like luminance difference between the disc and the background that it's on. And the neural correlates, maybe centres around neurons in the retina or in the thalamus. But the point I want to um, really make here is how you can measure this point of subjective equivalence. So you could use a method of constant stimuli once again. You could choose um, some test values uh, and you would say keep the reference uh, value fixed. So let's say I've got a reference stimulus that's fixed at three log units and I'm going to use various different values of the test stimulus and I ask the subject do you think the test looks greater than the reference? Greater meaning is it brighter than, is it heavier than, whatever. And so this is my psychometric function um, and I can fit a curve to it and then I can read off from that curve what the point of subjective equivalence is. It's the point at which I'm at chance, each response is equally likely. Now, as in this example, it may happen that the point of subjective equivalence isn't the same as the point of objective equivalence when the test and reference are actually equal to one another. And so that, that's telling you something about the bias um, in the perception here, as we saw in that example with the disks on the shaded background. Now, obviously, it's important if you're doing an experiment like this to randomise which response, uh, say, like the left button press or the right button press, corresponds to test greater than reference. Because otherwise, when you think you're measuring point of subjective equivalence, you might actually be measuring a response bias. So in this example, I've swapped over the reference stimulus, which is being held constant. Sometimes it's on the left, sometimes it's on the right. The subject is asking themselves which stimulus appears brighter, the one on the left or the one on the right, uh, and I can decode that into his test greater than reference. That could be a problem if you were asking people to make binary judgments about a single stimulus. 
Um, if you wanted to ask, say, are the dots moving left or right? Or is the line tilted clockwise or anti-clockwise? Is the square in front of or behind the fixation cross? Is the face male or female? And so on. That's not a good way to measure PSE because you don't know whether you're seeing a perceptual bias, which presumably is what you're interested in, or the subject's tendency to press their index finger when they're unsure. But you can still use this approach to get J and D. Um, if you want to get PSC, then you're going to have to use a, a two-interval approach. So to measure the J and D in a psychometric function like this, you start off with the PSE, so the point where the subject's at 50%. You define your threshold level, so that might be 75%, it might be 84%. And then the J and D is the distance that you have to go from the PSE in order to reach that threshold performance. Well, that's been an incredibly brief whirlwind tour of some aspects of psychophysics. Um, I think it's important because, as I see it, the key goal of neuroscience is, ambitiously, to relate all of human experience to neural activity. And just to zoom in on that and make it a bit more manageable, we start by relating sensory perception to neural activity. Now, obviously, if you're trying to relate A to B, you need a really precise measurement of both A and B, right? It's no good measuring neural activity in enormous detail, um, you know, through electrophysiological recordings or whatever, if you haven't also measured perception very precisely. And psychophysics as a field has developed very nice rigorous techniques uh, to measure quantities of interest, such as sensitivity or perceptual biases, while avoiding the confounds which are all too easy to fall into, due, for example, to changes in the decision criterion or response biases. Thanks very much. <laughs>